Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for being with us. I'd like to welcome and acknowledge you all. Thank you for your support, particularly if you've been affected by the bad weather over the last couple of uh, weeks, as many people have. Uh, thank you for making the effort to be with us. As you can see, today we've got a fascinating seminar topic. I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the tribal elders, past, present and future, and in particular, to acknowledge those who are serving, have served or will serve, and we thank you for that. Very briefly, I'd like to acknowledge and put in context uh, the presentation of a plaque to Doug. And as you can see, uh, we, we call this our pantheon. Uh, this is our range of past presidents, and if you would, perhaps that's a little small, uh, unfortunately, when we went to present some plaques to some of them, they had moved to another sphere completely. But uh, in a couple of cases, they were not able to make our 134th birthday, which was on the 24th of August, and we tried to make that a ceremonial event. So we managed to present the plaque to Air Vice Marshal Bob Trelaw at the last monthly lecture, and we're now pleased to be able to finish the, the, the project by presenting to Group Captain Doug Rosa, OAM, our past president, uh, a plaque in recognition. I'd like to just briefly say that Doug's service, I just wanted to acknowledge the enormous contribution that Doug made to the RAAF in the engineering sphere, into the civil aviation sphere, and then obviously, as far as we're concerned at least, into uh, RUSI as our president. And Doug, it would be our honour and pleasure if you wouldn't mind coming forward, please. And on behalf of RUSI, the RUSI board, I'd like to present Doug with a plaque. Doug, it's a pleasure to be able to do this. Could we just say thank you? It's a small tribute to all the effort that you have put in. And could we thank you so much for your service to the community and to Brucey? Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. That that's really great. Uh, RUSI is going strong. Good to see. Thanks for everybody who came along. Thank you so much, Michael. That's been really great. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, There's never a free anything, and so I just wanted to acknowledge that Doug has been a very active contributor to the monthly newsletters. If you've looked at the wide range of update that they represent when they are given to us, Doug and Theo uh, are the two key people, and uh, very sadly Doug has decided that his time is up on that. So we are looking for a replacement person, and one of the challenges is he sets such a high standard. Again, Doug, thank you so much, and Karen, thank you for supporting and being with us today. I'd like it now to hand over to our event coordinator, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ron Lyons, uh, to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Brigadier Hayden Cole. As President, thank you for fitting us in a frantically busy schedule. Hayden has just returned from an overseas trip, and we're delighted that you're able to be with us on such an important topic. So I'd like to ask Ron Lyons if he could come forward and do an introduction. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the eighth in our lecture series for 2022. The overall theme for our activities this year has been improving Australia's regional security, and the title of today's lecture is Developing a Guided Weapons Capability, and it'll be presented by Brigadier Hayden Cole, the Director General Explosive Materiel of, in the Defence Capability Acquisition and Sustainment Group. Brigadier Cole graduated from the Royal Military College in 1989 and was posted to the Royal Australian Electrical and Mechanical Engineers. He's held a range of regimental, staff, instructional and project development postings, including the Australian Light Armoured Vehicle Project, maintenance reform for the United Kingdom Land Command, during which 
He was awarded a CNC's commendation uh, for that work. He's been program manager for the M113 APC upgrade and has been an instructor at the United Kingdom Defence Academy. He's been the head of corps for RAMI, director general of land vehicle systems and his current posting as director general of explosive materiel. His operational postings have included Sinai, Iraq and Afghanistan, where he was awarded the United States Legion of Merit for his efforts in mentoring the Afghan Ministry of Defence on logistics, medical and information communications and technology matters. I had to ask my seven-year-old granddaughter what ICT meant. <laughs> Amongst all of that, he's previously competed on behalf of the ADF in the modern pentathlon at international level. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome to the podium our speaker, Brigadier Hayden Cox. Thanks, Ron. No, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's an absolute pleasure and a privilege to be here today. Um, I do have a presentation. Um, I apologise in advance, which is always an error, because I have been an instructor, so I'm used to instructing and presenting. But um, I think what we, you'll see today is there's a huge amount of work going on across defence in preparing to expand our current inventory of guided weapons and explosive ordnance and to build up you know, our inventories, and you'll see why in a moment. Um, absolute privilege to be here though, um, certainly amongst such a, uh, a crowd of honourable gentlemen and ladies as yourselves. Um, that's really what I'm going to cover today. So you, I mentioned at the beginning and was said in my introduction, explosive material branch. So I'm going to explain what that actually is, how it fits into the defence organisation because it's actually quite core to what we're doing with developing guided weapons and explosive ordnance capabilities in Australia. I'm going to touch very briefly on the defence strategic update that occurred in 2020. Then going to talk about this thing called an enterprise that's being developed. Um, those of you who have had project management experience would know that there are projects, there are programs, there are portfolios. So enterprise is a different term again to explain how that's being put together in Australia. What we've done so far in the last few years and then where we're going. Um, conscious that this is a great opportunity to present to a group of people who may otherwise not hear what we've got to say. You'll see there's some opportunities towards the, the back end of the presentation for those of you who might know people in industry who actually want to become involved in this part of the business because it is the, you know, one of the two biggest growth areas within defence at the moment. Um, so Explosive Material Branch, I've been the privilege, had the privilege of uh, leading this branch now for about four years. You'll see we've got about just under 400 public servants. We've then got about 200 contractors who work alongside us and you'll see in a moment I've got a slide showing where my branch is located around Australia. And then we've got about 660 other contractors who work with us. And for those that perhaps have had defence experience, and we were talking about it earlier, the majority of them are based at the old facilities at Mawala and Benalla, you may have heard of, country Victoria, country New South Wales. But we've also got people here on Sydney Harbour looking after mines who work for Kinetic, uh, people in Western Australia who look after torpedoes for me who work for Talus Australia. So right around the country looking after, and you'll see in a moment, you know, maritime land and aerospace uh, weapons. Um, having said that, the way the branch is structured is we have three main what we call system program officers and you'll hear that term if you talk to people in defence. And they're an amalgamation of people doing acquiring weapons, in my case, and people who are sustaining them. And we've got the three domain leads, so maritime, land and aerospace. And the reason they come together in what is truly a joint organisation is because as you look at modern weapons, the what we call effectors, the weapons themselves, are actually used more and more in multiple domains. So those of you who may have an Air Force background, you'd be aware of things like the AIM-120 AMRAAM, a medium range air to air missile. That's actually the primary weapon, the primary effector now for the new land based air defence. Because it's very expensive to develop a weapon, so if you can find multiple uses for it, you obviously get a lot more return as a company in how to employ that weapon. And from a military point of view, the good thing is you've got the same weapon being used in multiple domains. It means you can actually resupply across those domains. 
So more and more you see this effect of the, we the weapon itself being used in the land domain and the air domain or the sea domain and the air domain and that's becoming more and more common. The other thing is we're seeing is if you think back to, you know, literally World War I, World War II, and generally the weapon and what you call the sensor would be on the same platform. And that might be a soldier with a rifle where he or she is looking through the site and making a decision to shoot. That might be a ship that's firing its own gun or its own missiles to defend itself. As you look at a lot of the weapons we're now acquiring, these things are very, very smart. So actually the sensor and the effector are quite often on two totally different platforms and there's a network connecting them. So it might be an Air Force plane that finds a target but it's actually an Air, a uh, Navy ship that is actually launching the weapon because there's no reason to, for that Air Force target or the Air Force plane, sorry, to become a target by unmasking itself. So all it does is it provides information back. It's a Navy ship or a land-based weapon that's actually launched and that weapon then talks through the network to, to, the, uh, to the sensor. So it's a very different way of fighting than it has been in the past, which is why you see the, CD, the uh, Australian Defence Force is so integrated now and why there's, this, you know, there's a Joint Operations Command, for example, that by its very nature is joint. It's not Army, it's not Navy, it's not Air Force, because all three come together. The other two areas I have, which I'll touch on in a moment, I have what's called a munitions industrial base, which their focus is on these factories at Benalla and Mawala that I mentioned, and I'll show some, um, some more information on them in a moment. And their job is to manage the relationship with those factories, which are run on our behalf by Talos Australia. And then the last group I've got is this Guide of Weapons Explosive Ordnance, or GUIO as it's called, Program Office, which is focused on helping to develop this enterprise across defence and the broader Australian uh, industry base. So what do we do? There's about a thousand different munition types in defence at the moment. And whilst I'll focus on munitions and weapons, we also look after what's called install DO. So if your Air Force, an ejector seat has got explosive cartridges to get the, eject, to get the seat out of the aircraft, we also look after countermeasures, so flares, those kinds of self-defence systems as well. There's around about 35 different guided weapons and defences inventory at the moment. And that's everything from you know, a weapon that's held by a soldier, you know, a, something like a javelin, right through to SM2s on a ship or similar weapons on an aircraft, um, such as the Erasm that we bring into surface, so very large guided weapons. About 28,000 different stock items. Um, all that really means is we do a lot of the maintenance here in Australia, so we need all the subparts to keep those guided weapons going. Um, there's a series of information there about projects. Um, there is a lot going on. Um, as you can see, there's joint projects, there's air, there's land, there's maritime. The supported projects are where there is a project like Land 400 Phase 2 that people may have heard of that's buying the new Boxer Combat Reconnaissance Vehicle. That project is a multi-billion dollar project to buy armoured vehicles, but it's also buying guided weapons, it's also buying munitions, it's buying flares all the, or smoke grenades, all those other things that an armoured vehicle needs. So we support them. So there's a lot going on around defence and you can see um, all those projects. There's even estate projects because if you're doing an upgrade on a location such as Mawala where there's explosives being manufactured, you need a, you know, there's a fair degree of expertise needed to go in there and start building a new building or knocking down an old building. Um, so that's why we get involved in that as well. So just coming to locations then, um, just to explain the colour coding, the green are where there's a typically an acquisition team, like a project team that's buying a new weapon or a sustainment team that's looking after existing weapons. The red are locations where we've got a maintenance facility in Australia to maintain typically guided weapons. The blue in the middle are the two manufacturing facilities I've touched on a couple of times now, Benalla and Mawala. So one just south of the New South Wales Victoria border, one just north of it. And then the purple are some of the what are called now joint, um, uh, joint capabilities, which they sit within a joint area under command of joint capabilities who provides us with direction on what he requires from us in regards to this GUIO enterprise and in regards to day-to-day -day operation of the factories. So as you can see, um, all around Australia except for Tasmania and the Northern Territory are the only two locations we don't have people. 
Um, starting up in Queensland, you've got RAF Amberley for those that have been serving there. So we do the maintenance of the training missiles that are on the aircraft. So if you see an aircraft at, a, at an air show, the weapon on board is a training missile, which is typically called a CADAM, so a captive air training missile. It acts just like a normal missile for the plane, so the training, the instructor, the pilot can go through a full training program. The only thing it doesn't do is launch off the wing of the plane. Then you come down to Western Sydney, Orchard Hills, out near Penrith. Um, a, play, a location defence has operated since World War II. Um, we do a lot of the missile maintenance for the, the actual operational missiles out there for both Navy and Air Force predominantly. As I said, we've got a location here on the Sydney Harbour where we look after the training mines that are used for counter mine. And then right across in the west of Australia, HMA Stirling, we do all the maintenance of all our torpedoes. So two types of torpedoes in general terms. There's a heavyweight torpedo that you see a submarine launch, and then there's lightweight torpedoes that are launched by aircraft, uh, typically or by ships. So we have torpedoes that our P-8s, our surveillance aircraft can launch. We have torpedoes that can be launched off the ships themselves, and then the Collins class submarine launches a heavyweight torpedo. Um, down the bottom then you can also see there's a proof range. Once again, those particularly have been in Army would recognise the old Joint Proof and Experimental Unit. Um, they've got a location in South Australia where they can fire artillery shells, for example, out to sea, and then when the sea goes out, the tide goes out, they can recover them, expect the rounds, understand how they're performed. Um, there is another range just north of Puckapunyal where we also do typically smaller calibre uh, munitions. So there's quite a good um, you know, capability around Australia. That's just what defence itself operates. On top of that, we have a number of industry partners who operate facilities. So in South Australia, people would have heard of BAE Systems. They actually make components for some of our missiles for us. Up in Queensland, a company called NIA you may have heard of. Um, NIA has a facility up in Maryborough in Queensland to produce um, artillery ammunition or artillery projectiles. And I'll touch on that in a moment. So that, that's kind of what we're doing as a branch. So that's kind of the, the foundation understanding of you know, what Defence has been doing, what it is doing. Um, to describe in a little bit then those facilities, and I know I'm talking to at least one person in the room who knows these facilities well from a few years ago. So in Mawala, we have an explosive and propellant plant. Government owned, contract operated on our behalf. So what they do is they produce TNT and other high explosives. They also produce propellant predominantly for rifle propellant. So that Australia has that independent capability to make ammunition. And that propellant is the best in, best in the world for what it does. So in fact, we export propellant from Australia to the US for their special forces because the quality of that propellant is so, so high. Um, then you come across to Benalla and Benalla's only been there since the 1990s. It's where you actually manufacture the actual, uh, typically the actual weapons themselves. So a lot of small arms ammunition manufacture done there, as well as some bombs done for the Air Force. So two really great capabilities. Uh, I should have said Mawala has been there since World War II, but it's been modernised ever since World War II. The propellant plant there is only about 15 years old and is actually one of the newest in the world. So you know, as members of you know, the broader defence community as you are, you should be very proud that you've actually got some world leading capabilities there on which we're building rather than starting from scratch. So really, you know, really dedicated staff on site, some really great knowledge, and as I say, a number of products that we actually export elsewhere in the world because you know, what we do is the best in the world. The other benefit of course of that export is it means that when you talk about military operations, what we do in training is clearly a lot less than what we'd expect to do in a conflict. So the benefit of having that export is we've got extra capacity that if Australia then needs it at short notice, that capacity already exists. We're not trying to train people up to do something that can be as much an art as a science. I mentioned a couple of times now the maintenance facilities we've got. So at Orchard Hills, as I said, a place many people would know. Um, being very much revitalised at the moment. We've just opened a brand new maintenance facility for maritime uh, weapons. So the air defence weapons and the anti-shipping missiles that are used on our, on our ships. Um, three times the capacity we've had previously. So a really big facility, 
Um, once again, you know, the most modern in the world. Um, as well as that, Orchard Hills is now being built up further. So there's, we're putting back into all those old 1940s, 1950s buildings that some people might recall are steadily being replaced by brand new administration buildings to actually revitalise. And in fact, looking at uh, Orchard Hills becoming also an accommodation for site, in, site for people in Western Sydney. So becoming a real core part of the defence capability here in Sydney. The other big facility we've got is in Stirling, which is in, in Western Australia. Um, that's, as I said, where we do all our torpedo maintenance. Um, and once again, credit to you know, our people and the quality of the, the types of people you see in Australia. When we maintain a torpedo in Western Australia, it is, as far as the US government is concerned, identical to a torpedo that they maintain. So we're able to put torpedoes onto American submarines, if that's what they require, in the same way if we're operating in a, you know, off Hawaii or something, they can supply us with torpedoes. So once again, you know, real cutting edge. So when people talk about, you know, can Australia do a guided weapons enterprise, our answer is we're already doing a lot of it now, and there's absolutely no question why, can't do more, why we can't do more in the future. Um, which leads me to this guided weapons and explosive ordnance enterprise. Um, essentially what happened was in 2020 there was a defence strategic update uh, conducted. I'm sure many of you read the report and you may even have had previous presentations on it. And what it identified was that there was a lot of modernisation going on in our region. You know, a lot of very modern equipment or equipment's coming in across you know, the Southeast Asia, Southwest Pacific. And the other thing that it identified was that the warning times that defence had traditionally expected, which was typically about 10 years, were probably no longer relevant. We couldn't assume that there was 10 years to prepare for a conflict. And what that meant was that in our case, the 10 years that we had assumed or expected we would have to acquire more weapons in preparation for a conflict, just in case, um, we couldn't assume we had 10 years to do that. We had less time. And so there was very much a guidance and direction from government to say, you need to, you know, consider what you've got in your inventory and see whether it is sufficient if you don't have 10 years of time to build it up. And that was a very clear message to us. And what that led to was the creation of this thing called a Guided Weapons and Explosive Ordnance Enterprise. And really the enterprise is all about increasing our inventory. So that's, that's the fundamental output of the enterprise is an increased inventory. And really, as you can see, there's three ways we're going about this as an organisation. The first is we're acquiring more weapons. Both of the, some of them are the same ones we've already got. Some are more modern weapons from overseas because that's where they're produced now. So that's, in many cases, the quickest way to increase inventory. The second is we're actually increasing what can be done in Australia. So I've mentioned, and that's why I focused on those maintenance facilities, how can we do more maintenance in Australia to reduce the need for weapons to be sent back to another country for maintenance? Because that means that those weapons are available if we need them. And finally, we're looking at local manufacture of subsystems and in some cases weapons in the future. And this is when you think about it, you know, it might be that one, you know, that one cable, that one component that's stopping a weapon being available to put it on the wing of a plane. If that can be made in Australia, it reduces the time it takes to get that component from somewhere else in the world. Now, to back this, the government put a billion dollars into this enterprise. And the best way to think about the enterprise in simple language is an ecosystem. So the enterprise itself is not a weapon, it's all the things you need to support a weapon. So a billion dollars to help build up that in Australia. There's also a further about a hundred billion dollars over the next 20 years in the investment plan, what we call our investment plan, to actually acquire weapons and to support that enterprise as it goes forward. So a significant investment in recognition of the importance of having the weapons you know, when they're needed in the inventory. Um, and when you look at that ecosystem, and that picture up there is the way we describe it when we're briefing people, it's not just manufacture, it is all those other things you need to be able to do research and development, to do disposal when you finally get a weapon reaches the end of its life, all those other aspects, storage and distribution, which is really quite complex for some weapons, because some of these weapons we have are so sensitive that they actually have a life that they're allowed to be transported for. So you've got to actually, it's quite sophisticated where you store them 
because you actually don't want them to have to travel long distances on road if they can't, if they, you know, that consumes up some of their life. So you can see all those aspects of what the ecosystem is. So it is complex because it's not just focusing in on one simple piece because you can't do manufacture if you can't dispose of the parts that you've made that didn't work. You know, there's no point doing R&D if the R&D doesn't lead to something else further down the path. This is just another way that we describe the, the, the uh, current situation, which is really looking at it in three time frames. So accelerating what we're doing now and getting after weapons. As I said, we no longer have that luxury of 10 years in our planning assumptions. Growing the base to support those weapons um, and it includes growing industry because it is, you know, when you're literally getting into rocket science here. So if the com you know, companies that may not have worked in this space just need to develop that knowledge um, and understand some of those things that are, are unique to guided weapons. And then finally there's sustainment, which is really very complex in a guided weapon space because you might fire a relatively small number of weapons year to year in training. So there's not a large demand for them. But of course, if you actually want to go to war, as people have seen in Ukraine, the consumption rates go right up. And we are talking about it earlier that a few months ago it was reported that there's been Ukraine in a few months has fired seven years of the American stock of Javelin. And that's really a reflection of that difference between what you do in peacetime and what you need to do in wartime. So that sustainment is a real challenge for us because we can't have an industry that's only based around raise, train and sustain. But equally, if we build an industry that's got that growth path in it for operations, how do we make sure it stays viable on an annual basis? So what's been happening? Um, I mentioned in 2020 the Defence Strategic Update. So that's what drove all of this. Um, March last year, the Prime Minister announced that this was being accelerated. Um, July last year, we then went out to industry. We had our views on what we thought um, should be done and where the, you know, what, was, what were the key decision points in getting to an enterprise. What we wanted to do was see what our industry partners thought about it. And this went out right across the world, but obviously a lot of Australian industry as well, um, to help us understand what are the things they believed we needed to focus on to get moving. Because we had some great expertise ourselves, but we know industry also has a very large you know, group of, um, there's a large group of companies with a great deal of expertise, many of which don't traditionally work in the defence sector. They might be in an adjacent sector such as space. Um, what we then did is in April this year, we announced that we'd brought Lockheed Martin Australia and Raytheon Australia on as two strategic partners. And for those that may not know these companies, Raytheon and Lockheed Martin in the US are two of the major primes that do guided weapons and they supply about 80% uh, plus of the guided weapons that Australia uses. So the intention was get their, their local entities, so the Australian entity, to actually partner with us because if we want to do this quickly, they have access back through their parent to all that technical know-how and that, you know, that, un that equipment and all those processes that their parent companies have done for many years that they can rapidly bring to Australia to enable us to move very quickly on it. The other thing we did in recognition of where our capacity kind of ends was we brought on three other companies or we've invited three other companies, the Sovereign Missile Alliance, Australian Missile Corporation and Oricon, who are Australian companies to actually operate and complement our workforce. So recognising there are things that Defence doesn't have expertise in and one might be growing trade capabilities in TAFEs. Well these are companies that can help bring those ex that expertise in when we need it so we understand where to actually, you know, where to bring their expertise in so that they can help us rather than trying to grow that inside defence when it's not something we might do as a core business. So that's, that's all been happening over the last couple of years. Um, a lot of work going on in those four activities, or those particular last, uh, the RFI and that announcement. Parallel to that, you'll see on the right hand side, um, is the engagement particularly with the US but with our other allies around the world. Um, both to see what they can do to help us but also to see what they're doing in their own right. Um, because we're not the only people who are starting to build up inventory and starting to focus on modernising with weapons. Um, as was said in the introduction, I've literally just come back from the most recent trip to the US on the weekend because we are, you know, it is changing that dynamically 
that we are discussing with the US, you know, what are those opportunities to help support them and be a good ally from Australia and where can they help us in accelerating things. Because as I say, most of our weapons come from companies like Raytheon and Lockheed Martin in America and the US government obviously has a, is a, plays a critical role in what we can do and how they can help us to move quickly. Um, the other point I'd make on that engagement, it's, it's a message we send very strongly. This is about increasing inventory. It is a huge inventory we have on a daily basis. We don't need to do everything, so how do we complement the US to actually get the results we want quickly? So there's no, we're not in competition with the US government. We don't want to build industry in competition with the US industry. We want to see how we can work with them to do the, you know, help them with the things they need help with, do the things that we can only do. But if there's things that they can do to help us without us having to engage, then that's good as well because it means that we can focus on those other areas. So where are we at now? Um, the first few points I've already mentioned, so we've been multiple engagements with the US government and other allies. Um, most recently, as I said, this uh, in the last few weeks, um, there's another engagement with the US next month. They're then coming out to Australia in December as well. So there's really happening quickly for those that are used to perhaps defence projects taking a long time. You know, this is changing on almost a weekly, certainly a monthly basis as it evolves. Um, brewing on those partners, so both the Lockheed Martin and Raytheon Australia, or Lockheed Martin Australia and Raytheon Australia, but also these other companies to help us as what we call enterprise partners to go after the things that we recognise defence are not necessarily the experts in doing on a day-to-day -day basis. I mentioned uh, Orchard Hills um, and the factories I've mentioned a couple of times now, we're continually upgrading those. So as I say, the propellant plant at Mawala is one of the most modern in the world. Um, we're now putting in some um, new ways of doing bombs um, that have, you know, there's only two or three places in the world that are doing them. And this is really exciting and I'll talk about it in a moment because it means that we've got this capability in Australia that actually is world leading. Um, and that's something we should always be proud of. Um, for those of you who come from the operational bent within units, um, a lot of weapons coming. Um, so JASM ER is a air to ground strike weapon um, coming to go as an accelerated procurement onto our uh, Super Hornets. So a fantastic capability coming for the Air Force. Our RASM is a similar weapon. It's designed though to hit ships. So it's an anti-shipping missile. So once again, some really, really capable weapons. Some air-to-air -air weapons for the Air Force there. So short range and long and medium range uh, anti-air weapons. Um, and then the bottom one is an anti-radiation missile. So these are the weapons that when you're flying over enemy ground territory, uh, enemy territory, they actually target radars. So they're able to actually follow down a radar and destroy a radar that might be operating an air defence system as part of an air defence system. So some really leading edge capabilities that are coming into service um, for all the services, you know, Army, Navy and Air Force. Uh, Tomahawk, people would have seen videos of Tomahawks firing off ships, US Navy ships. Um, Australia is getting uh, Tomahawk, the Prime Minister announced it. Uh, we're working through now, that'll be launched initially off our Hobart class destroyers. So a real capability there um, to give a very long range strike capability to our Navy. Uh, Naval strike missile, that's another form of strike missile, um, particularly um, used once again on a number of our Navy platforms. Um, then the last two weapons there, ESSM and SM2, are two air defence ship uh, missiles. ESSM is a short range, what they call a point uh, defence weapon for those of you with Navy background. And SM2 is what's called an air defence missile. They're operated off our, um, our destroyers and our ANZAC class frigates, or will be. Um, so really capable weapons coming into service. So this is all about how do we get the best weapons to our soldiers, our sailors and our aviators so that they've got the best chance of coming home alive. So it's really about that capability side. Um, some more weapons, you can see there's a lot, you know, three pages of just things, this is last 18 months of weapons that are paralleling this broader enterprise. So new lightweight torpedoes for the Air Force and the Navy. Sea mines uh, operated by the Navy. Um, I mentioned a few times bomb manufacture down at Mawal and Benalla. So we're doing bombs there. Um, 
Joint Strike Fighter is a phenomenal aircraft that's come into the Air Force. With it comes a whole new range of weapons, including bombs, so you know, what you call a dumb bomb. Um, what's really great about doing these in Australia is two of these bombs, the Blue 111 is a 500 pound bomb, the Blue 126 is what the Air Force calls a low collateral bomb. But they're exactly the same body shape. So if you're making them in Australia, you can determine what type of operation you're on and you need more low collateral bombs or you need more 500 pound traditional bombs. That gives you that kind of flexibility by local manufacturer, whereas if you're buying it from someone else, you've got to try to get that, that um, break correct before the operation might start. Um, large calibre munitions, um, talking in the break beforehand with some people, this is looking at you know, 5 inch for the Navy, 155 artillery for the Army and 81 millimetre mortar for the Army. Um, what can be done here in Australia? And you know, the key here is it's all about capability, so it's not just a projectile, it's not just that piece, it's what do we do about fuses? Do we make those locally? Do we perhaps buy a large amount and store them locally? But how do we make sure we've got you know, a fuse, an actual projectile, and then something to actually project it out of the gun? So it's looking across the whole range. You can realise how this becomes quite complex very quickly. And the final one there, Spike LR2, is an anti-armour weapon that's coming in on the Boxer infantry fighting vehicle I mentioned earlier. So where are we going into the future? Look, there's a huge amount of opportunities here because the, you know, the future hasn't been written yet. It is evolving that quickly. We are setting the foundations, but we are developing the plan as we move along. So this is about developing capability as quick as defence can by acquiring it where appropriate, but also by developing capability in Australia so that actually we're ready to go and we're ready to be a true ally to the US and other countries when we need to be. And you know, when the Australian government wants us to do something, we've also got that capability here to operate on behalf of the Australian government. Workforce, workforce is one of the biggest challenges anyone is facing in Australia, and we're no different. There is not a large workforce of people out there who are explosive ordnance engineers or who are guided weapons engineers. Um, they have to be built. Um, we traditionally have sent people to the United Kingdom to do our training and they go there for 12 months. We're just starting next year a new master's degree in Australia in explosive ordnance to start building up the engineering level of workforce. But then there's all those people that actually do the work on the line, the people who may be making a weapon or the people who are maintaining one. So workforce is one of those key areas where we see an opportunity to help work you know, far more broadly than defence to get something that makes a real difference here in Australia. Industrial capacity, um, as I said, we've got to build it up, but we've got to build it up in a way that it can surge. Um, and you know, these are all kind of almost open-ended questions because there are so many different ways you can do it. Um, but we need to get it right because there's no point getting it working for a year or two and then that company disappears because it wasn't viable. Um, the final point there is about intellectual property, technical data. Um, Guided weapons are one of the most valuable things a defence company can manufacture because it really is the crown jewels of their technology. So every company in the world is extremely sensitive about their technology, as are countries. Obviously you don't want other countries knowing what you've got necessarily. So how we protect that data when it's trust entrusted with us is critical to how we succeed. Because if we fail to protect it and it's, you know, it's taken from one of our companies and shared with another company, then you can expect that whoever shared it with us is not going to do that again. So we're managing very carefully how we do that part of the business as well. So where do we go to in the future? Um, this is a national endeavour. This is not something Defence on its own thinks it can do, nor do we expect to do. You know, we need support from the states. We need support from broader industry, including companies that have never necessarily worked in the defence sector, because we want them to do things that we haven't previously done in Australia. Uh, we need support from other government departments, even at the federal level, because as I said, things like training are not necessarily our expertise. Department of Industry clearly know a lot more about industry more broadly than we might. Um, it will evolve. Um, this, as I said, there's only there's 35, approximately 35 different guided weapons. That's not even including everything down to a, a 9mm pistol bullet. So every single weapon will have its own strategy for how we have an inventory that defence needs. Um, some of them will be acquire it and put it on a shelf, some of it will be manufacture, some will be somewhere in between. Um, 
but it does need to be responsive. Um, 12 months ago, if we thought there was going to be a major conflict in Europe, a large percentage of the population would have said that was extremely unlikely, not going to happen, including a lot of people I expect in Europe. Um, that is how quickly things are changing. You know, it is a far more uncertain place than it has been previously in that way, and people are still coming to terms with what does the future look like. And the reality of the years, it is continuing to change, and strategic circumstances are evolving, you know, certainly on almost a monthly basis. So what, what I would say to you today, I would expect if someone stood up in front of you in 12 months' time, it would evolve on what I'm saying, but in some cases it might be quite different because they're learning new information every day on what is happening out there. Um, and in our space, you know, one of the biggest uh, areas of opportunity are things like hypersonic weapons. You know, where do they fit in in the future? Are they a defensive weapon? Are they a strike weapon? Are they, you know, how are they going to be employed? So it is evolving very quickly, which is where there's great opportunities as well, um, because in some of these cases, no one else in the world has necessarily got it all solved. So why shouldn't Australia be the ones that are helping solve it? You know, why should we you know, wait for someone else? Um, last week, uh, the Minister uh, for Defence Industry was in the US talking to the US about this. And as he said, you know, it is all about the technology moving forward to give us that strategic edge. We don't have the large numbers that some other countries might enjoy in their army or their uh, military, but it's also about that trust, you know, that trust to be there when we're, we need to be, that trust to have what we need, and that trust to protect what we've got to make sure that it ha does give us that technological edge you know, when it's needed. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is my very uh, quick flash through a presentation. It's really an opportunity to give you a context of where we've come from and really invite questions on some of the things that are happening. Um, and as I said, I'm, I, I will unashamedly admit that I, I see you as a great marketing opportunity for us when you're talking to people back in your companies or people that you may know who are in industries who may not have thought of working in defence. Here's your chance to say, well, actually, this is a whole new part of the defence sector that really hasn't been you know, developed to the level it needs to be. So why not come in at the ground level? So thank you. So thank you for a very interesting and comprehensive presentation and uh, giving us uh, uh, some more light on defence capability and in particular defence uh, partnerships uh, that are developing. On behalf of the Institute, I'd like to present you with uh, an honorary membership and also with uh, an institute time. Thank you, Thank you. And If anyone's looking for a job, we've got lots of recruiting going on at the moment, <laughs> lots of opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to finish extremely quickly. Um, this year, sorry, this half year, we've explored OCAS, and I'd just like to promote to you the value of booking in and attending our 22nd of November major seminar. Uh, it's going to be in three parts. Part one, all of the vice patrons, the forces commander, that's Navy, forces, uh, second division and air commander, will be giving us a brief 10 minutes or so on what's significant, what's happened in their command this year. Nothing specifically about OCAS, it's quite deliberate that we'll have our forces commanders with us as our vice patrons. Part two is TALUS, the Defence Innovation Network and the University of Sydney will give you an update brief on what they believe is happening with OCAS one year on. There'll be a panel opportunity and then finally we're going to give you a brief on what has been the, or what is, the RUSI submission to the major defence review, which is underway at the moment. And Talos has agreed to sponsor the seminar, so the major bait is that there's going to be some free drinks at the end. But quite apart from that, uh, I do hope, firstly, the bookings are open. Uh, we hope that you will be able to attend. It's a very significant afternoon. We hope you'll be there. In December, our Sir Herman Black Year in Review is uh, Mr Paul Kelly uh, from the Australian newspaper, and could we urge you to think about joining us for our Christmas luncheon, which is in effect the next day. So, we, on closing, 
Sir, could I thank you again for an excellent presentation and a wide overview, and I can assure you that a lot of people will be contacting, because I can think of a lot of people who need to know about this, and I hope that is the case. As I'm finishing, thank you for being with us today. Doug and Karen, a pleasure to see you. Thanks so much for coming and, and uh, being with us. And to everyone, thank you indeed. Our session is finished. Thank you.